Hi guys, this is Andrew with Headphones.com. Welcome to the Headphones Show, and today we're going to talk about the Sennheiser HD820. We're talking about frequency response and EQ. Now, I'm going to give my EQ profile for this, and I have measured this on the uh, Gross standardized measurement rig that we have. Um, but I want to explain first why I think that it's necessary to EQ this headphone, or why I like to EQ this headphone. First, the good things. This headphone does actually have, uh, in spite of its tonality, quite good detail retrieval. Uh, and it also has really good soundstage and image separation and depth and layering and all that stuff. And I really like those qualities about the Sennheiser HD820. The other important thing to keep in mind is that this is a closed back headphone. So it, for the most part, stops sound from leaking in and out. Um, it's not the most closed and most sound isolating headphone out there. Um, I'd say it's actually not really that great for that either, but it's certainly more isolating than an open back headphone is. Um, and for anybody wanting a high-end closed-back headphone, like I always am looking for, um, this is one of the high-end options that are out there. And then, importantly, it's also extremely comfortable. I find this is one of the most comfortable headphones to wear for long periods of time. So, my goal is to get the Sennheiser HD820 to sound better. Now, if you like the way that the Sennheiser HD820 sounds without EQ, that's totally fine, but this is one headphone where I think it's fairly uncontroversial to say at this point that it has a very strange frequency response and a very strange sound to it. In particular, it sounds quite woolly in the bass, but then still quite hollow in the lower midrange, and then it also sounds a little bit muffled in the upper mids and lower treble. And so the goal is going to be to try and improve those areas to make it sound a little bit more normal, and then also retain its you know excellent technical aspects like detail and soundstage. So let's dive into the measurements and talk about frequency response and EQ. Okay, so this is how the Sennheiser HD820 measures on the Gross standardized measurement rig. This means that we can be confident in its accuracy. The red line here is the Sennheiser HD820. This is the raw measurement and the dashed gray line is the Harman target uh, hybrid that I've actually put together. So it's using the bass from the 2013 Harman target and it's using the mid-range and treble from the 2018 Harman target. If you guys want to see more target curves or measurements of this headphone relative to more tar target curves, I will be posting them on the headphones.com community forum and uh, I'll leave a link in the description for that. Uh, but for anybody who's wondering why this doesn't look like a flat line, anytime you see a measurement that's relative to a flat line or that it's supposed to measure flat on, that's always relative to a compensation. So what I'm showing you here is just the raw measurement of the headphone plus the graph of what the target curve would end up being if you ended up normalizing that and uh, making it flat. And if you want to know why this has the elevation here that it does, well, that's because this is loosely correlated with what our brains expect to hear because our ears will amplify these frequencies. And obviously the red line here, the Sennheiser HD820 has many problems, at least for its frequency response, that we need to address, not just the primary ear resonance up here above 1K, um, we actually have to do quite a bit of adjustment in the bass. So we're going to do our best to try and get things in line. The one thing that I want to mention here is that we don't want to match it perfectly to this target because after a bunch of testing that I've done here, when you do match it perfectly to the target, it actually does give you quite a bit of distortion there. Uh, not actually in the 300 hertz region, but in the 3K region, you do get quite a bit of distortion there for the, the upper mid-range. And so I'm going to be a little bit more conservative. I find that the Sennheiser HD820 doesn't actually respond all that well to EQ. It doesn't respond as well to EQ as the ZMF Verite or the um, Odyssey LCD-X does. So we're going to have to be a little bit more careful here and, you know, do things a little bit more by ear than perfectly matching this target. So let me just walk you guys through it. You can use whatever software you like, but I highly recommend Equalizer APO because it is system wide and you don't have to deal with any, you know, issues with the software. This is one of the more standard softwares for EQ. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to drop the bass. <laughs> we're going to we're going to add a down shelf to the bass here and that's this right here. Now it looks like a shelf that would boost the bass because normally that's what it's used for, but you can do this, you can use the same filter and just go negative two. Um, you could go more here, but I find that negative two works out to be okay. Keep in mind that these intervals are, uh, well, they're more fine grained than even one dB. So for these little ones here, they go by 0.5. So two dB is decent. Uh, and then you'll notice that I have here at 55 hertz, I've dropped it 
also by 2db with a peak filter. And that's because when you do add a down shelf, it doesn't perfectly match it where you want it to. You have to be, you can add the down shelf, but I noticed there was a little bit of a bump there with the frequency response afterwards. So I just added that extra 2db just to make it a little bit more smooth. The next thing I've done here is I've boosted 75 hertz by 5.5 with a medium Q value. Remember, this is how wide or narrow a frequency range you're adjusting. So the lower the number here, the wider the range, the higher the number, the, the smaller the range. And so we're going with 1.9 to try and boost this whole area and get it to be a little bit more even. Uh, I just want to note that 5.5 looks like a lot more than you would actually need to get it here uh, because it's only really 2 dB off. Um, but keep in mind that the because we're using a medium to wide Q value here, um, it's actually going to affect the range, the ranges around it, meaning that because we use a low shelf here or a, we use a base down shelf here, um, it's actually going to influence how much we need to adjust this section by. So, you know, they, there is a little bit of compounding going on here um, so that ultimately you end up with something like that looks like this which gets things to be a little bit more in line with where they should be. And then the next thing I do is I try and get rid of this crazy upper bass bleed section here, which in my mind is one of the worst parts about this headphone, but I do understand why it's there. I think because the the dip at around 300 hertz is so extreme, in order for the headphone to have any sense of body, you know, this upper bass section here needed to be elevated a little bit. I, I, I do understand that. I, I think... You know, ultimately, it's, it doesn't sound very good, but if this if this isn't there and then the 300 hertz dip is still there, it, the whole thing just sounds really hollow. So, you know, it, it might sound a little bit wooly, but this might have been the lesser of two evils in tuning the headphone. So what I do here is I drop uh, 100 hertz for this section here, the rise, uh, and then I also drop 145, which is this middle section here. And I've dropped them by different values because they, they're at different ranges. And again, this, this tries to get it to be fairly close to that target. It's not perfect, but you'll notice, you know, the lower bump here is pretty close to where this is. And then the higher bump here is pretty close to where this is. So it ends up having the effect of reducing this by an appropriate amount. You can achieve this any way that you want with any combination of filters. I just found that using two in two different places, uh, you know, reducing it by these amounts ended up working out for me. And then we move to the other significant problem area, which is the 270 hertz dip or 300 hertz dip, basically, uh, the lower mid-range dip. And so I boost 270 by about 7 dB. And I also have this be kind of narrow because there's a fairly sharp slope here. So one of the tricks that I, I've sort of discovered with this is that if you have a slope like this and you're trying to you know, make this, fix this issue. Um, you can make it a little bit more of a narrow Q value to get that. And then a little bit higher up, you add the rest of the, uh, of the adjustment. And because they will affect one another, as we can see here, you'll end up with something that overall ends up being a little bit more gradual than if you were to just have that one filter with that one narrow Q value, right? So if it were this just one filter in the middle, it would be a slope like this on either side, but because I've got two filters here or two adjustments, um, you know, this one ends up being a little bit more gradual on this side here, which is kind of what we see going on here. Just, you know, the inverse, right? So the idea is we're trying to fill this in and that's kind of what this does here. Uh, so the next section that I use is uh, 580 Hertz. That's to try and boost this little last piece. So I bump that up by two dB with a medium Q value at around two. You know, one of the risks when you're doing this kind of EQ is that you might fill something in, but if you're using too wide of a Q value here, it can also boost the elevation and then that can be a little bit more noticeable. And then uh, moving up into the upper mid range here, I do adjust 1.553. That's just where this happened to be by 1.5 dB. Now it seems very minor. It seems like it's not all that much, but because we're using a, well, we're using a medium Q value here, and then we're also adjusting 2K with a fairly wide Q value at 1.41, it's going to adjust this whole range by whatever the compounding effect is of 1.5 and 2. So this whole range is going to be boosted a little bit. And again, I stayed as conservative as I could, even though it's not enough to 
properly match the target. And the reason for that, again, is because this headphone does not respond as well to EQ as I would have liked. So just my whole EQ in general is just a little bit more on the conservative side. Uh, but the next adjustment that I do is 3500 which ends up being right there. And it's to try and get this whole section up. I don't mind where this is at. I think it's a little bit warm in this area. It could be a little bit more forward. But the other thing to keep in mind is that, you know, if we're not adjusting too much in the treble, if you overdo it in this upper mid-range section, then it, it has a risk of sounding a little bit shouty, a little bit honky and nasally. And you don't want that to happen. You have to you know, take into consideration what's going on for the rest of the frequency response when you're, when you're ending up with a certain elevation uh, in one range or another. And the same thing is true for the lower, you know, the lower mid-range dip. You know, I think it's important to keep in mind that when you're doing your EQ, you can't just adjust one region or another region independently you have to think about the effect that this is going to have on the rest on the way that things are going to sound the overall balance uh, and so you know we're trying to boost this by a little bit but not too much because then that would be out of balance with the rest of where the treble is so how do we get there well we adjust 4k by 5 db and again both of these 3500 and 4k uh, hertz are both fairly narrow q values because this is a little bit of like a plateau you don't have to do it this way. You could probably go like right at around 3600 with one filter and then just boost that range. But doing it this way means that you don't have as much of a peak here. And then it also doesn't really affect this all that much, the 5K Hertz all that much. It does still elevate it a little bit, but I didn't want to go too narrow. The other issue uh, that I noticed is when adjusting this range in particular, like 3K to, yeah, 3 to 4K Hertz, um, this is where your second and third harmonic distortion start to show up when you do start boosting it by values that would be a little bit more appropriate for how much this deviates from the target. So I stayed, you know, fairly conservative. I actually think five is probably a bit much even. I think this would probably be closer to, you know, 3.5. <laughs> uh, but this is, you know, I think it's one of those questions of, you know, is, is which is the lesser of two evils here? And in my opinion, the, you know, the second and third harmonic, it's not audible enough where it matters more than the frequency response issues that are present here. So I think it's a good idea to elevate this a little bit, but not, again, too much just because you don't want to overdo it there. Once you, you know, match it to the target, things start to sound pretty weird. And then moving up into the treble, because I've adjusted this mid-range section here a little bit, because I've elevated this, I also want to keep that balanced with this treble response. So from, yeah, like 5.5 .5 to uh, to like 7K or like, yeah, roughly between 5.5 .5 and 7K hertz. Uh, it's not that this is on its own without EQ all that out of balance, but when you elevate the upper mid range, suddenly you're throwing it out of balance with your EQ. So you need to make sure that you also take the treble into consideration here to, to keep it in balance. And so what I've done is I've boosted 6.45 uh, by 2.5 dB. That's, again, this section right here, roughly, where this, you know, the, the strongest part of the, the dip is there. And then this brings this range up a little bit more appropriately and keeps it in balance with the rest of the adjustment that's been done. Um, these are areas where I think you need to be listening to the headphone and you need to be seeing which of these elevations uh, is appropriate because you may find that you know 4k should only be elevated by 3 or 4 db and you know 6.45 could be elevated by only maybe 2 db it's really just a matter of preference and taste at that point aim for balance for the different frequency ranges not necessarily fixing one thing or another um, and then what I've done here above that at 8.67k hertz, that's like up here, I've added a bit of a boost there. It's interesting because this is another one of those cases where I don't think it needs it. The problem with this area in particular is that if you do try and match the target, you once again start introducing second and third harmonic distortion that's really not good and it starts to be audible. And really that's all I do. I don't mess with these adjustments here that could be done for the same reason, you know, this looks like it's just had a, a number of resonances removed and that's pretty much it. I would like it to be more even for sure, but it doesn't have, it doesn't come across as if it's missing all that much here because the ranges around where these dips are, are still present. Now I do think it rolls off in the treble a little bit. Uh, I think this overall Harman target, I think it does roll off in the treble as well. So if you wanted to add a treble shelf, you could, uh, 
you know, just to give it a bit more air up top. But I'm personally fine with where this ends up being once this EQ gets applied. So once again, let's take a look at what this ends up being. Here is the overall adjustment curve that I end up applying. So if you're using Rune or something like that, try and get it to match this relatively closely and you'll get whatever I ended up getting uh, with this as well. Just keep in mind that this 8.6 or 8.7K elevation I think is also optional. And if we take a look at what the frequency response ends up being after EQ, that's this, which again is not perfectly matched to the target, but this is about as far as I'm comfortable getting it because Again, I don't want to start introducing things that shouldn't be there or don't sound good. And to my ear, this is what ends up sounding pretty good. I think there are some other adjustments that can be done. Let me just go over this, um, the default tonality here. I think there are some other adjustments that could be done. I actually find that this 270 dip here could be matched a little more closely. You know, I was actually a little bit surprised that this area in particular it seems to respond reasonably well to EQ. So you could get this lower mid-range section to match the target a little more closely if you wanted to. The issues with the EQ don't really show up until you get a little bit further up in the frequency response. So if you want to be a little bit more aggressive here and get it a little bit closer to the target, you can. Just make sure you're using small increments and you know evaluate by ear at this point. Uh, and then same thing with this bass section here. You could probably get this to be a little more even by adjusting it a little bit more. Um, once again, do this by ear. For the upper mid-range section, which in my mind was one of the bigger concerns, I didn't match the target and I didn't really even get all that close. I just filled it in as best as I could and elevated it a little bit, but I didn't want to go any further than this. And this is where, again, you could go more aggressive, but I would caution you against doing that because that's when your second and third harmonic distortion starts to show up. So for the upper mid-range, even though we didn't perfectly match the target, we did improve it quite a bit. Let's take a look at how, what it was before. The main goal here, I think, was to even it out just a little bit, and we did that. And then the treble balance needed to be adjusted as well, and I think we did a pretty good job there. Um, let's look again. Here's how it was before, and then this just boosted it by a little bit. Once again, if you boost the upper mid-range more, then you also need to reflect the treble as well to ensure that there's a decent amount of balance. I don't like that this 5k hertz peak is there. And that's another thing that you may want to try and adjust. It's there even in the default tonality, right? Like that that 5k hertz peak shows up. So we've made it a little bit less noticeable by doing this, but I do wish that it were a little bit less intense. So again, if you want to be a little more fine grained than this, that's another area to look at. And then uh, this measurement actually is without the 8k hertz adjustment. Um, so it's pretty darn close to what the um, other one was. I, again, I don't know if this is necessary. This is up to you. Uh, but for me, I like it when it's there. So with it sounding like this, again, it's not perfect. This is a weird sounding headphone to begin with. And it does still retain some of its characteristics. But I think overall, this is a lot better than what it was before. And uh, this, is, this is where I'm happy with as a starting point. And then over time, by ear, this is, you know, I would uh, change it and adjust small things here and there by, you know, 1.5 uh, to 1.5 dB. And I would, really wouldn't go much further than that, but it's uh, this just sort of gets the, the ball rolling on getting this to sound good. So after doing EQ to the Sennheiser HD820, I've gotten it to a point where I am starting to really enjoy the sound. I think it can still be improved a little bit, but also, you know, this is something where I don't think it completely escapes the, you know, some of the weirdnesses that exist with closing off the back of the cup with the, um, with this glass here, the concave glass. So I think this is just something where if you're looking for a closed back Sennheiser HD800S, it's just not really something that you can quite get, uh, even if this gets close in many other ways. But I found that what I've ended up with here is actually quite nice to listen to. It's, I think, still not quite as agreeable a frequency response as like a Focal Stelia, but uh, it's definitely a lot better than what it was. And this is something that I think I'd be able to live with um, and enjoy for a long period of time if uh, I already owned a Sennheiser HD 820. Anyways, if you guys want to see more measurements of the Sennheiser HD820 and see how it stacks up to a number of different target curves, I'll have that posted in the headphone forum, and I'll leave links in the description where you guys can check that out as well. But that does it for this video. If you guys like what I'm doing here, consider subscribing, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye for now.